the biggest financial asset that you have going for you by miles is the value of your own earning power over the years. Focusing on your financial fo future, that means you should focus on you. All of you in this room have the brains to do extremely well in life. You've all got the energy to do extremely well in life. And then the question is, how do you apply it? If you've got a 200 horsepower motor, you get 200 horsepower out of it, you get your full potential, or do you get 100 horsepower or 50 horsepower? Now there's two things that can hold you back in getting the full horsepower out of your, your engine, whatever it may be. All of you have big enough engines. And one of those is a lack of education, but that probably isn't gonna to happen to very many people in this room. If you did have a lack of education, if you, didn't, if you didn't have a chance to get a decent education in life, it wouldn't make any difference what that potential was because you'd never unlock it. But the second most important thing, and equally as important, is in terms of the habits that you develop, in terms of what you do with yourself. When we hire people, we look for three qualities. We look for integrity, we look for intelligence, and we look for energy. But if they don't have the first one, integrity, the other two will kill you. Because if you're hiring somebody without integrity, you really want them to be dumb and lazy, don't you? I mean, you know, last thing in the world you want for them is to be smart and energetic. So smart and energetic only goes with integrity. Think about the person you would most like to be in life. So maybe it's one of your contemporaries, maybe it's somebody a little older, but pick out the person you admire the most, the person that you'd change places with if you could. And then write down why you admire them. Just put it on a piece of paper. And then figure out the person that you would least like to change places with you. Who really turns you off? Who do you find repulsive? And list the reasons why that person turns you off so much. And put those down on the other side of the paper. And then look at that list. And you'll find that everything on the left-hand side, what you admire in other people, the qualities they bring to life, um, cheerfulness, you know, generosity, all kinds of things. You'll find those are things you can do yourself. It's very simple. You gotta apply yourself, but the habits you form in doing that early on will carry you through life. And on the other hand, you'll find that the things that make people repulsive, selfishness, obnoxiousness, all these things, egotism, are things that no one has to have. If you find those in yourself, you can get rid of them as long as you get rid of them early. So all I suggest is that you write, you write down a list of what, what you admire, what you find uh, contemptible, and decide that you know the ones on the, on the ad, ad, admired side are, are ones you're gonna acquire for yourself. And if you do that when you're young, it'll carry you through the rest of your life. This doesn't work if you do it when you're 50 or 60. By then the habits are too well formed. Uh, but if you do it early, behavior becomes, becomes a habit. I would say, you know, avoid credit cards. Just forget about them. Uh, we're in various businesses that issue credit cards. The American public loves credit cards. But if you start revolving debt on credit cards, you're going to be paying, uh, 18 or 20 percent. And you can't make progress in your financial life going around borrowing money at 18 or 20 percent. You can make a lot of money by lending it out at 18 or 20 percent over time. Uh, you know, if you can find anybody that's good that uh, will borrow from you, but you don't want to be on the side of the equation that's always behind in life. Uh, you know, I was lucky. I'd saved about ten thousand dollars by the time I got out of school. That ten thousand dollars was really worth millions. I might have earned later on because after you get a family and everything, the, the expenses roll in. But but those were my tools to work with, but it was only because I was ahead of the game. If you're behind the game by $10,000 at some point and paying 18 or 20% interest on it, you will never, you know, you'll never get out of it. So the trick, I've got a partner that says, all I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I'll never go there, you know. And, uh, and that's true in financial matters as well. You want to figure out where you don't want to be uh, ahead of time and avoid that. And I get about a dozen letters a day from people who are having terrible problems. And there are two reasons why they have terrible problems. One is a number of them have had health problems of some sort. I mean, they have really been hit by some, or somebody in their family has been hit by some kind of catastrophic uh, illness. And that is a, you know, it's a terrible thing to happen to any family. And they get in, they run up bills they can't pay. And, and really only society can solve that one uh, uh, in terms of protecting people against that. It, that's just plain bad luck. But the other one is from people who run up credit card debt and uh, they're facing bankruptcy or they've been through bankruptcy once before and they owe a whole bunch of money and they can't, they can't even pay the interest, let alone pay any principal. 
and half of my letters come from people like that. And that, that, that problem is avoidable. Catastrophic illness is not, but, but, uh, credit card debt is something you bring on yourself. It's way easier to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble financially. And, and, uh, I will guarantee if you run a big credit card debt, you will be in trouble, uh, probably the rest of your life in terms of, uh, your financial situation. On the other hand, if you get ahead of the game, uh, even it's on a very modest scale so that money is coming in from investing and you're, a, you're, a, you, people owe you money or equities owe you ownership. Uh, you'll be way ahead of the game compared to paying it, uh, being, always being paying, uh, your creditors every month. So my advice to you is, uh, if you can't pay for it, don't buy it and, uh, get yourself in a position where you can pay for anything. It is true that a market system does not pay as well in some, in, in some activities as, as might seem appropriate for the importance of those activities to society. Just take teaching, for example. I mean, teaching does not pay well. And what could be more important? I mean, I, you know, you've got to be as, as interested in who your, t the teachers of your children are as, as who your accountant is or, you know, uh, whatever, or who's winning the heavyweight title of the world or that sort of thing, but it doesn't pay well. And, and, it's a fundamental choice, uh, whether you're going to go into something it, for many people, it'd be a, it'd be a fundamental choice, whether you're going to go into something you love or something to, to try and make a lot of money. I think that generally it pays to go with what you love. And, uh, uh, I think that it's very hard to find people when they get to be my age who say they're on, that they've loved what they've done all their life and feel it was very worthwhile. Uh, but they're terribly sad they made that choice because they didn't make a lot of money. I, I, I don't think anybody's ever, ever said that to me, that they wish they'd gone into something else where they were uncomfortable doing it or didn't enjoy it, didn't feel very productive, but made a lot of money. So I don't, I don't think you'll find that. So I would, I would, I would go to work in whatever turns you on. It may turn out that it'll, it'll be more profitable than, than you can think, but almost everybody here will make enough money unless they get some terrible habits along the way to do reasonably well and, and doing reasonably well in this country really is, is, uh, is pretty darn good. I mean, it, it is, it's not necessary to have uh, huge amounts of money in order to enjoy yourself. I enjoyed myself when I was, had my $10,000 and I live in the same house that I lived in when I was making, when I had about that, I bought it 41 years ago. I liked the house then I like the house now. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a reasonable job, You'll be eating at McDonald's and I'll be eating at McDonald's. So we're, we're to push on, on, on food. I mean, you know, I hope, in fact, I hope it's Dairy Queen actually. And may, may, at, um, uh, and if you come to Dairy Queen, you'll see me and you can order anything on the menu I can order and we'll, we both can afford it. Um, uh, you know, you'll, you'll wear the same clothes I wear. I, I'll pay more for my suits, but as soon as I put them on, they look cheap on me. So we'll, we'll look about the same. And, uh, uh, We'll both live in the same kind of houses. I live in that house from 41 years ago and it's, 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 it's warm in winter and it's cool in summer and it's comfortable. And you'll live in a house that's, that's similar. And then, and what difference does it make if you have 50 more rooms or, you know, guest houses or all that? It, you know, it'll probably just bring you problems. I mean, you have to worry about the, about the greenskeeper or something when you get through. So I, 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 I have been in the houses of people, uh, where the houses are worth, um, oh, probably 200 times. Uh, what my house is worth. And I would not be any happier in those houses at all. In fact, I'd, I'd be less happy. I just have one more thing to, to worry about. And, you know, the dozens of people around the place and people quitting and people stealing from you and all kinds of things to hell with it. You know? uh, we drive, we'll drive the same kind of car. In fact, you'll probably drive a better car. I drive a car that's about eight years old. I don't know what it's worth now, but it gets me around fine. I mean, I, I'm perfectly happy. We'll, we'll watch, we'll watch the same television, you know, We'll, we'll work on the same computer pretty much. The only difference will be how we travel long distances. You know, I will fly in a plane that's more comfortable than, than flying Southwest Airlines or something, which uh, I've got nothing against, but uh, that's the one real big difference. And other than that, I do what I like every day. I hope you, you'll do what you like every day to do. And uh, I work with nice people. I hope you work with nice people. Uh, and that's, there's 24 hours in the day and those are where the hours go. So, Great wealth is the tiniest bit different uh, in a real sense than having just a decent, a decent income. And, uh, and to trade a decent income 
and something you love doing and something where you feel worthwhile doing it for huge wealth where you trade off a lot of your principles uh, would be a terrible mistake. I was very lucky in life. Uh, if you tell me who your heroes are, I, I will make a pretty good prediction about how what you're going to do. And I, I, I had the right heroes. I was very lucky in life. And uh, my heroes never let me down and started with my dad. And then I had others in business. And so I have had great teachers, some formal teachers, some that were just uh, informal teachers, teachers by instinct or example. And uh, if I hadn't had those, uh, you know, my, my life, I'm sure, would have been very different. If I'd been born anyplace else. When I was, I was born in 1930, uh, and at the time, one out of 50 births in the world were in the United States. So I came in against 50 to one odds against being born in the United States. I would have, I would have been a disaster, you know, if I'd been born in Afghanistan or, or Peru or someplace. I mean, I was extraordinary. I won, I won the lottery the day I was born, you know, by being born in this country. So have you. Uh, I mean, you, you, the odds were probably 40 to one against you being born in this country. And it were five times more likely to have been born in, in China or six times and four or five times more likely you've been born in, in, in India or some other place where it would not have been as easy to exploit the full potential of your talent. So we've all won the lottery in that respect. And, and that's just plain luck. I mean, it, uh, and I was lucky to be born at this time. I mean, capital allocation is something that pays off extremely well in this society now, but it doesn't pay off in other societies. And it, didn't pay off, you know, many years ago. My my friend Bill Gates says that if I was been born a few thousand years ago, I'd have been some animal's lunch. You know, I I can't run very fast and I can't climb trees and you know I just happen. Those are talents. Nobody asked me to climb trees now, but uh, there was a time when it might have been important. And incidentally, Bill would have been some animal's breakfast. I mean, he can't run so fast either. But uh, in any event, uh, you know, we we are lucky. I mean, just imagine being born a couple hundred years ago with exactly the same talents and how far they would have taken you then. You know, the average person today lives so much better than the richest person lived uh, 100 or 150 years ago. So uh, I'm lucky in that respect, I'm lucky to be born of terrific parents. I was lucky to be raised in Omaha in a, in, a, in, a, in a great public school system. I got a start here in the first eight grades that gave me a foundation that later when I went off the track a few times, uh, carried me through because I had a terrific grade school education in at, right here in Omaha at Rose Hill. And one of the reasons I had it incidentally is kind of unfortunate, but I had that great education uh, in part because women were being enormously discriminated against. And so a woman at that time could be a teacher, she could be a secretary, she could be a nurse, you know, and that was about it. So you had a half the talent pool in the United States limited to just a few jobs. So you had an abundance of talent uh, in those activities like nursing or, or, or teaching because uh, that talent with males was spread across every act, every form of work activity there was, but with women, it was concentrated in a few areas. And that, that benefited me. It's kind of sad because it didn't benefit those teachers, but, but I was very lucky. And uh, I've really been that way uh, all my life. And what I do is what I do is important as, you know, what a good teacher does or a good nurse does or something of the sort. You know, I, I think that's quite questionable. It pays off enormously well in a market economy like the United States. And, uh, but that's an accident. It didn't have anything to do with any innate ability of mine. Well, it, it's not, it's not very complicated. Uh, it goes back to getting full use out of your own talents first. I mean, the difference between whether you're going to be earning X or 2X or 3X a year uh, 20 years from now uh, is going to be a function of how well, not how much talent you have, but how, how well you use the talents you already have. And uh, so that is the, your best financial future is your own ability and, and, and your uh, a capacity to to use those abilities to their potential. And they can't take, that can't be taken away from you. Can't, they can't even tax it. I mean, uh, you know, most things, if you, if, if you own a, if you own a piece of real estate, if they double the taxes, they double the taxes and that changes your ownership in the property because now 
In effect, the taxing authorities own more of it because they've got a greater command on the revenue stream. Uh, the same thing about uh, almost any asset you have. Uh, uh, but they, they, uh, they don't tax what's in your head. And they don't tax your ability to start performing when you, when you get to work in the morning and finish in the evening uh, to, to your potential. One of the things that amazes me is how people who really do perform well just sort of jump out at you once you're running a business. When I got out of school, I thought, you know, everybody would behave that way, but they don't. Most people sort of go go through life in a sleepwalk. And and it, if you don't, you will stand out. So the big the biggest thing for your financial future is yourself. Now, beyond that, it is always being ahead of the game rather than getting behind the game. It's saving a little, no matter how you do it. I mean, I delivered papers. I worked at pennies. I sold golf balls. I had a pinball machine around. I did a lot of things that enabled me to accumulate about $10,000 by the time I got out of school. Uh, 10,000 doesn't go as far now as it did then, but it having anything so that you're ahead of the game and not getting behind the game is enormously important. I mean, just, you know, if you're going to run a hundred, hundred yard dash against a bunch of people in life, uh, if you can figure it out so that when the gun goes off, you're 10 or 15 yards ahead instead of 10 or 15 yards behind, it's going to make an enormous difference in how that race comes out. So, uh, having, having some net resources doesn't make much difference whether they're in stocks or bonds in my view, but, uh, uh, and not having debt when that gun goes off, when you get out of school, uh, is a huge plus over being behind the game. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it may come from delivering a paper out in the morning. It may come from part-time work someplace, but, but put aside a few dollars for yourself that, uh, uh, so that when the time comes and you enter, you enter the workforce, uh, you're ahead of the game and not behind. And then once you get there, don't get behind by buying a whole lot of things that you figure you're going to pay for someday while you're paying 20% interest in between. Well, that's a tough one. I mean, I guess I'd pay it off as fast as I could, and I would incur as little debt as, as possible in before that time came. And I would say this, in my experience in business, there is very little difference, if any, between a very high-priced business education and what's available a lot for a lot less money. So I, I'm, I, uh, I went to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln my last year in college. I went to Wharton for a couple of years before that. Uh, uh, I learned just as much at the University of Nebraska as I did at Wharton. At, uh, uh, and it's nothing against Wharton. I mean, it's just we had a very good school here. I had some terrific professors at, at Lincoln. And so I, I would not assume that if I was paying a few thousand dollars for an education, uh, here in the state, for example, versus paying uh, huge amounts elsewhere, that it was going to make a lot of difference. Uh, uh, most of, a lot of the education, uh, you, you need to be prodded in the right direction, but an awful lot of it is, 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 is self, is self-taught. But, um, uh, I mean, Andrew Carnegie did a wonderful thing in this country in terms of libraries, and I used to spend a lot of time at libraries. I even got locked in at the University of Omaha when, what was then the University of Omaha, and they had, I couldn't get out for hours and uh, one night I got so entranced with what I was reading, but it, there's, there's all kinds of information available. Now with the internet, it's so much, you know, easier than it was then. So, uh, it's out there to be taken and it isn't necessary to pay 30 or $35,000 a year to go to some, uh, big name school to get the education at all. I mean, if you're going to learn accounting, if you're going to, which is probably the most important course you'd take in business, if you're going to learn accounting, you can learn accounting absolutely as well. In my view, going to UNO is going to, to Harvard. I mean, I, I see, uh, I bet on that. And uh, I wouldn't run up huge bills in terms of getting a business education. Now, you know, if you're going to get a medical education, I mean, there's certain professions where there, there may not be any way around spending a fair amount of money and getting in debt to some degree. You've got to make that decision yourself, but I'd certainly try to minimize it. And, uh, uh, and I would sort of, I would have it figured out how I would handle that debt in say a five year period after I got out of school or I would think twice about incurring it. Yeah. I, I don't think you, that, uh, you're going to have enormous economic problems. I think you will live in a society where the average person, uh, lives better by a significant margin than the average one of a generation earlier or two generations earlier. That's been the history of this country. It's a marvelous country that way. I mean, 
it, when you think of it, we have four and a half percent of the world's population, you know, and, and what's been accomplished here is incredible. 53% of the, of the value of corporations that are publicly traded in the world exists in the United States with four and a half percent of the population. This country always has done well. Uh, they say in stocks that you should buy stock in a business that's so good that even an idiot can run it because sooner or later one will. And, and, that's not terrible advice. Well, that seems to have been sort of the history of this country from time to time. I mean, we've we've had all these problems that have come along. If you look back on the last hundred years and list all the problems this country has run into, you know, you can make a very long list. And a lot of people who focused on those problems at the time have missed the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that every generation lives better than the one before it. And that's because of uh, that's because of savings, because savings enable people to create new tools to do better things as they go along. And it's also due to an environment that lets people realize their potential to a greater degree than most other environments in the world. It's far from perfect. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad how far it is from perfect, but it is better than anything else around. I mean, in, in this country, uh, you've got, you don't have some commissar or something running a you know, the, a, a big business in this country, you've got a guy like Jack Welch and, and a fellow like Jack Welch makes a difference of night and day in terms of the productivity of that business over a period of decades. And productivity is what a, is what causes the standard of living to rise. So anything that a system that throws up the Jack Welches of the world to run businesses is going to have an enormous advantage over a society that does it by heredity or that does it by government edict. And we've got we're closer to that society that I've described than, than, than anything, than any other country. And it's, it's led to, to great things and it will continue to lead to great things. So I think, I think you've got the best future. Uh, you know, you don't face, you don't face a war and you've got a, you, you've got a, a great, uh, you've got a better future in terms of achieving material rewards than any generation in history. So I like to find Businesses that have good economics. Now, what, what are good economics? Well, good economics are a business that has some kind of a moat around it that makes its product or its service or its location or something a little more desirable than to the customer than any other sort of comparable product. You know, the number one candy bar in the last 30 or 40 years has been Snickers. People don't fool around with different candy bars. They fool around with different length dresses, they fool around, you know, with all kinds of things, but they don't fool around with candy bars because they figure, you know, they're going to go in and lay out 50 cents or whatever it is and put it in their mouth. And they're not going to, for 50 cents and putting it in your mouth, I mean, you're not going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll put in, I'll lay out 45 cents and put something else in my mouth. So you find that very stable. And we like businesses that we think we can figure out where they're going to be in 10 or 15 years. I don't know where the information technology businesses are going to be in 10 or 15 years. I know where Snickers bars are going to be in 10 or 15 years. They're going to be selling just about the, you know, the way they do now. I know where Wrigley's gum is going to be in 10 or 15 years. There's not going to be a lot of innovation in, in, in chewing gum. And pe the internet's not going to cause people to quit chewing gum either. I mean, at least, I mean, Gates may think so, but I don't think so. <laughs> but, uh, it's predictability regarding the sustainability of a competitive advantage. Some, something special about a product. So we look for those kind of products and then we look for people that are running the business that are honest and able. It's easier to find people that are honest and able than it is to find businesses that are going to stay wonderful for a long period of time. There are a lot of businesses that looked like they were going to stay wonderful that really evaporated over time. But that's what we're looking for. And the nice thing about it is we don't have to find very many. If we find one a year, that's terrific because you, know, you don't. You don't need a hundred or a thousand great investment ideas to do well. You, you need a couple. And uh, if we, the discipline is the most important thing. We don't need brain power. We, we need discipline. And, uh, you don't need 150 IQ to do what I do. Thank God. You know, you don't need 140. You don't need 135. You may need 115 or something like that. And, and, but you do need discipline. You have to wait until you see the fat pitch to swing at. Because investing is a no-called strike game. You know, if I, if I were a baseball player and I only like pitches two inches above my navel, you know, some guy could learn that and he could pitch me, you know, three or four inches below that and I get called out on strikes because I never find a pitch I like. You can get called out on strikes in baseball. 
you have to swing at pitches that you, you don't even necessarily like, particularly after the count gets to two strikes. In business, you don't have to swing at anything. You can sit there and the paper says General Motors at 68 or it says General Electric at 115 or it says General Dynamics at 63. And if you don't like those prices, you don't have to swing. You can wait there day after day after day after day and there are no called strikes. Now, when you swing, when you decide to buy something, then, you know, if you swing and miss, it's a strike. But it's a marvelous game to be in because there are no called strikes and you can simply wait for that one time in a month or six months or a year or two or three years when you really know what you're doing, where you like the price, where you like the people running the business, and then you swing and you only need a few swings in your lifetime. Uh, so that's the way we try to pick businesses. We try to stay with, with things we understand. I mean, there can be all kinds of wonderful investment opportunities out there that I don't understand. I don't know what cocoa beans are going to do next year. You know, maybe you know, but I don't know. I, I don't know what, I don't know what uh, crude oil is going to sell for. Now. But, I don't have to know. I just have to know the things. I have to know what I know. I have to know where the limits of my understanding are, the, what I call my, what my circle of competence is. And if I'm only able to evaluate 5% of the businesses in the world, no problem. I just stay within that 5% and try and find something. Uh, and that's most people get in trouble because in investments because they uh, well, they get itchy, you know, they can't discipline themselves and they hear about other people making money. Nothing upsets people so much as to hear about their friends making money. I mean, it, that, that's very destructive to discipline because they think, you know, I'm smarter than that guy next door and he just, just bought that new car with the money made trading stocks on the internet, so why can't I? Well, the answer is you can't over time. You will lose money if you trade stocks actively. And uh, uh, it's, it's hard to exercise the discipline. But anytime you buy something, you should be able to take out a one page sheet of paper and say, I'm buying General Motors at 65. I'm buying General Electric at 150 because, and you should write down the reasons. If you can't, if you can't fill out the sheet, if it's because somebody told me about it at a cocktail party last night, that's not good enough. If it's because my broker told me about it, that's not good enough. You know, it's, uh, you've got to have a reason for thinking that it makes an intelligent investment. You do the same thing if you're buying a farm or an apartment house. If you're buying a farm, you'd say, I'm buying this farm at $1,000 an acre because I think I can earn $60 an acre on it. If corn sells at such and such and soybean sells at such and such and yield is such and such, and you'd figure it out. That's the same reason you buy businesses. And when you buy stocks, you're buying a little piece of a business. And that's probably the most important thing to remember in, in investing is that when you are buying a stock, you're buying a little piece of the business. and it, if you are buying it at an attractive price for the business, for the whole business, you're going to make money. And if you aren't, you know, over time, you won't make money. Well, I think very difficult to quantify moral standards over time. I mean, it, it, you know, you can, you can pick out huge weaknesses at any given time in terms of how people or the country is behaving and, 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 and oh. huge strengths. So I think it's enormously difficult to quantify uh, I think, by and large, we have made progress in what I would call institutionalized moral standards in this country. I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, in terms of slavery, in terms of the, uh, in terms of, I mean, the women, women couldn't vote, you know, a century ago. It, uh, half the country were second-class citizens in that respect, in a very, and, and they had much lesser rights in, in terms of inheritance and all kinds of things. The income tax didn't exist a hundred years ago. So the idea of taxing people according to, to how much that they benefited from society and their income, uh, didn't exist. So I think in terms of institutionalized moral standards, the country has made really quite significant progress, uh, in the, in the last hundred years. I think, you know, there's an enormous distance to go. I think we're going in the right direction, maybe by fits and starts, but I think we're going in the right direction. And I think that, uh, it will be a significant plus to everybody in this room if they live in a more moral society 40 years from now than, than a less moral. But I think the odds are that they will. I think the country moves in that direction. Very difficult to do it. All kinds of interests that work against it. But uh, in the end, I think the American people want it. And, and you saw it in civil rights. I mean, it took television to dramatize what was going on and people that weren't near it preferred not to think about it. But it got through to the conscience of uh, the American people. And uh, uh, a lot of progress has been made there and there's a lot left to be made, but there, 
it's better than it was. And the pace may seem very slow to those people involved, and I can understand that. Uh, the pace, you know, for women's suffrage, I mean, that went for decades and decades and decades. Woman could be on a jury. I was reading the trial of Clarence Darrow, which took place in California in about 19, I don't know, 10 or 11. You know, there were no women on the jury. The woman wasn't allowed to be on a jury. They weren't citizens in that sense. So it's the moral behavior of the country has, in my view, improved, but it, uh, and it'll continue to improve. And I hope you all in this room do your part to help it improve. I think it's important that you save money, you know, and whether, whether you put it in the stock market or not, it, uh, I don't think is terribly important. I think if you're interested in stocks, you should, you should buy it, you know, and you've got a little capital, you should buy a few. I mean, I don't think there's any way of learning about them better than experiencing it. Doing it on paper isn't the same. I can guarantee you, if you lose money on paper or lose real money, it's a different experience. And uh, uh, I think you'll learn more about yourself if you do it that way. I bought my first stock when I was 11. I was Actually, I was at Rose Hill at the time, and I bought three shares of City Service Preferred at uh, 38, and it went down to 27, which is something I still remember, even though I was 11 at the time. Uh, and then it went up to 40, and I sold it. I made five bucks on my three shares after commissions, and then it went to 200 and something. So, uh, you know, I, I, I probably remember that a little better than if I'd been doing it on paper. You know? <laughs> and I fooled around doing a lot of things between about age 11 and 19 in the stock market. I did charts. I did all kinds of technical analysis. I read every book I could get on the subject. And I didn't do that well. I didn't do terrible, but, but I, I, did, I was really just floundering around. But by... That meant by the age of 19, when I read Ben Graham's book, I was at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, I went and bought this book called The Intelligent Investor, just come out, and it had an enormous impact on me. Now, if I hadn't done, in the previous eight years, if I hadn't been all over the lot, I'm not so sure that that book would have had the same impact on me. I mean, I was, by that time, I was prepared to read Ben Graham's book, which changed my life financially in, a, in an incredible way. I mean, it, I wouldn't be up here today if I hadn't read that book. But... Yeah, part of life is getting prepared so that when something does happen that's significant, you can grasp the significance of it and know what to do with it. And I would say that first eight years of fooling around, even though it produced nothing financially to speak of, uh, produced a lot in terms of getting my mind prepared for when I really did read something that made sense. So I was ready to accept it. And I actually went back and went to Columbia to study under the, under Graham and, because of, of reading that book and all kinds of things flowed out of it. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in the field, to do a few things. I'd still try and make them as intelligent as possible. I would try to stick with things, businesses I thought I understood. I'd still get out that sheet of paper and I'd write, I'm doing this because, and just test my reasoning. And then I'd go back and read it a year later and, and see whether what you thought would be true turned out to be true. So I would always check myself. I believe in grading myself on everything. The country as a whole is quite, quite well prepared for the future. That doesn't mean I adopt, would adopt every policy they have. But I think, A, we have an enormously rich society, enormously rich society, and it'll get richer. Uh, everyone isn't going to participate in that. Some will, won't participate because of physical disabilities, others because of mental disabilities, others because of shortcomings in the education they received when they were growing up, all kinds of reasons. We have a prosperous enough society to be able to take care of, of of those people, and we should take care of them. And how we do it so that they feel most useful in life and how we do it so that we continue to encourage people to be more productive themselves and all that. I mean, those are not easy questions, but but that shouldn't take our eye off the ball of feeling we should do something about it. it you, want, you want people, you want a system that directs, gets people to their potential and and puts them in the position where they can do the most good for society. But you also want a system for the people who get the wrong ball. I mean, somebody's gonna get the ball, you know, that says ADIQ. Somebody's gonna get the ball that says this disease or that disease early in life that cripples them. And we've got a rich enough society that we can, we can take care of those people. And I think that, to get back to your question, I think that this society will move more and more in that direction. It has the capability of moving more and more in that direction as our resources uh, and our output increases. And I think that it has the will to do that in a general way. Although, like I say, there have always been lots of fits and starts. So there is no shortage in the United States of resources. 
There's no shortage of output. You have to have a system that encourages people to behave to the limit of their abilities and puts them in the right place. But then you have to make sure that everybody gets taken care of.